Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash. It is very unfair that I have to manage my anger because other people do not manage their stupidity. And Dale Hummel. You need to hang out with people who fit your future, not your past. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel, along with co-star Ryan Rash. Hello, hello, hello. Is that Ryan or Brian? Shut up. (laughs) You did that on purpose. I did. I did. You caught me. You did that on purpose. You wanted him to think that my name was Brian. Which I am perfectly okay with because I don't want Joe Exotic knowing who I am. So I'm fine. I thought maybe, maybe I felt some chemistry there. Zero. Zero. (laughs) Zero chemistry. I will not repeat the line that he repeated because we don't have any disclaimers on this one. And I'm not joking with y'all. After he said such line, I blacked out. So no, I do not want Joe. I no. I I felt like I needed to take 12 showers after that interview. (laughs) I understand. Understand completely. Well, I, I I have current events, but it may not be. You told me you had no current events earlier. Well, I, I do. It's not very worldly, but oh, they are well, still current events. Well, I'm going to start because by the time this drops, it will be Pride Month. God help us all. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. My like thoughts. The, the, like when when does it officially start? June is the month June, of Pride. June. June. Oh, every day in June. Every day in June, it's the month rainbows, of unicorns, Troys, yeah, all, 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 all of all of that shit. And so, anyway, and I know I have voiced my thoughts on Pride events and Pride Month on here before, and I have had some very angry, both closeted and semi out people in the livestock industry give me their opinions <laughs> on what I think, which I don't care. But I'm 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 going to tell you this, and I'm going to say this now. Because I'm fixing to express some opinions about this, and hopefully I can get my venting out for all of Pride Month in one podcast. But I do not want any of you people to think that I am ashamed that I am gay. If I was ashamed of it, I would not have ever come out. I would not be so vocal about being a homosexual or gay or any of these other things. I would just hit it like all these other people do and judged every major show in the world 45 times over by now. So I'm not ashamed of being gay. I also do not think it is something that anybody, or at least I do not feel it is something to be celebrated because it is just one part of me, not the whole thing or anywhere close to me. So yeah, I don't get the whole part. Just like I don't know why white people think they need to have a white people's day or straight people think they need to have a straight month or any. I don't get that because it's me oh, wait, being gay. Wait, 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 wait. So there is a white month? No, but they want one. I I don't, I'm I'm not being racist. I do not want one. I am white. I am straight. I do not want a month. I I don't understand. I do not want a day. I do not want an hour. I I don't understand why we have all these days or all these months to celebrate everything. Because again, to me, it is just one part of who I am. And that's all there is to it. it. It is not, I don't even think it is significant, actually. But no, not not relative to the crazy that's within you. No, <laughs> See, exactly. It's I do not. not I do not think it's significant that. at all. Not but even on, not even on my radar. Exactly. There are many other things that could be way more oh, significant. Yes, yes, yes. But so since we are talking about Pride Month, the Dodgers have caused quite an uproar, and they have a Pride Night event and whatever and all this other stuff. And so there is this group of drag queens, so DeSantis will hate them the most, called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And what they do, they dress as nuns in drag. And it's to demonstrate or protest against the Catholic religion or something, whatever, all this other stuff. So, long story short, I I don't think it's nice to make fun of anyone's religion, but they were disinvited to Pride Night, and they got a big backlash. So now they're back at Pride Night, and the pitcher for the Dodgers, he spoke out on it, and he he didn't condemn them, but he just brought up that they also have another deal later, which is the Christian. They have Christian Faith Day. Dodgers do, and so his stance on this is to promote the things he believes in. 
and not, you know, condemn or talk about stuff that he doesn't agree with, which I think that's a very mature, very responsible uh, response to the thing. But th- th- this, this, this is my problem with Pride Month right here in general. This is going to be all month long. All these companies are going to put rainbows on shit and hope that the gay community buys them. And then after that, they won't talk about them for another year, all this other stuff. And I also have never understood the concept of a bunch of people in these major cities that where all these proud events take place being half naked, covered in glitter, drunk, drugged, or both, running around screaming, I'm important, pay attention to me, I have rights. How that is going to make anyone who did not like homosexuals or gays beforehand make them more tolerant. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. I have a solution. <laughs> no, you don't get a solution. I have one. No, no more No more months, no more days, no more, why, why, I don't, what was the something religious day? Just be gone. Just all of it, just all of it together, be gone. All be gone, and I and I, I am a little bit jealous. So these companies and corporations and others are pandering to the gay for a month. Is what basically what it comes out to. Yes, I I have to do it every single week. You have never pandered to me in your life, <laughs> sir. You wish. Oh, uh, I appreciate your your comments on this. On a serious note, I I worry that nothing different than I don't know. It's different, but. Black Lives Matters and and all these other days and and things like that and groups that you you can only be a certain type of person to be in that group all of those things to me do more hindrance to stimulate racism or homophobia or whatever it may be than what it ever gains I I just I don't understand it at all I've never understood the concept either but I mean like they have National Black History Month okay. And so they promote history of the African-American culture and all this other stuff because they claim that, like, it wasn't written about. I can almost buy that, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm closer to that. I, I, can, I can almost buy that, okay? Seriously. Well, I think what it should I just be written understand. about and it should be in, in, in every day, not just in a month. Right. My thing, and again, it wouldn't matter if I was gay or straight, whatever, the concept of this does not work. No, it's it's definitely maybe maybe we, you and I just aren't looking at it correctly. But from no, my concept, viewpoint, no. it's terrible. If someone like me who is gay, openly gay, does not think this is a good idea, then there is no straight person has a problem or homophobic person has a problem is going to think this is a good idea either. Okay, it's just not. But it, I, I can't say that. It, it necessarily affects me one way or the other, but it is definitely not helping. Have you ever seen one? Man. No. Have you ever s- actually seen what goes on at a pride parade or a pride event? No, just you. Okay. Then don't it. tell that, me it doesn't just, affect you. It will. Well, no, it doesn't because I haven't seen it. Exactly. If, if I were to have seen it, it, it would affect you. the most. Maybe it they're better me. now. Maybe they're better. No, now. they're not. <laughs> no, it was just that one last year. Okay. No. Walking down the street. Yeah, because I happened to be in a city that it was going on. But, I mean, I wasn't like... You participated? No, I wasn't on a float in a parade, but I was there the same time that city was having their pride events, sir. I remember you mentioning that. You you, you were very unimpressed. <laughs> no, I mean, I have been to the biggest one, New York City. I have been to it all, and no, they're not good. But also, I was... You, you intentionally went to the big one just to see what it was all about. Yes, if I was going to do one, I was going to do it right. Yeah, and I, I, I was like, oh, no, mm-mm, done. But I, I have more current events that involve nothing gay. Thank God. I, I hope for you listeners, I've got that out for the month. I can't promise, but I just, I, you know, I have to. So I, I encourage all of you to go to his Facebook page and just post rainbows and comments. Every post, <laughs> rainbow, mm-hmm. rainbow, rainbow, maybe a unicorn. I really, really don't like you right now. <laughs> okay. So, um, Joe, your president, not Joe Exotic, not the wannabe president, but the actual president. So, all these people are piling in in the Republican primary. Your boyfriend, DeSantis, there are other ones. There's very strong possibility that Glenn Youngkin, who is 
governor of Virginia is going to announce this week, all this other stuff and whatever. And so all these people are piling in. They're all going to Iowa, all this stuff. Okay. Like this week. So now, because I, and I am glad that I have got some clarity on all this, the Tom, the Tim, Tim, Tom Scott, whatever is the very nice black man from one of the Carolinas that I like, DeSantis, Young Ken, Nikki Haley, all, all these people. So today, a man that I have never seen before, it's on Fox News, and he explains that every, including DeSantis, who he does not believe DeSantis will end up second, are all running for second. And I was listening to this, I was like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Then it finally all made sense. Because he says the reason that all these people are coming in and all are running for second is they think with all the other legal issues that Trump may or may not have and all this other stuff, while it will not keep him from running for office, he thinks that if it all piles on and gets as bad as it could, that Trump will pull himself out of the race for president and whoever is second will actually be the nominee. Now, two things here very quickly. Mm-hmm. You do not believe that for a second. No, I don't not. believe it worth the, no. And and if he were to pull out, it's not who's in second that's going to necessarily lead. That is going to change the dynamic so much it's unpredictable at that point. Well, the first off, I don't believe the man's ever going to pull out. And no, secondly, the, no. the the bit the biggest portion of this that this man missed is if for some unforeseen reason he did, let's just which he's not, but let's say he quit. It didn't matter who's second. Whoever Trump says you vote for this one, that's who wins. Yes, whoever he chooses to support. Yes. But, but it's not, it's all Whether they were 17th, 3rd, 2nd, or whatever else, it does not matter. And I, I would agree with that, but it comes down to, there is nothing that I can think of that if Trump is leading and believes he can get the presidency, that would force him to pull out of the race. Oh, I have no idea. I, I can't foresee anything whatsoever at all. But I, I, I did find an, that was an interesting take on it, at least. And the reason I bring this up is all this happened because they had this on there. Because your brother Joe, the president, not your boyfriend, Joe Exotic, he was asked after at some point who he wanted to run against or who he thought would be whatever all the stuff. And he says that he's not even keeping up with it. It doesn't matter to him whatsoever at all that it, he, he doesn't even know who's running, which he, that may have been honest. He may honestly not, but, and then the other thing is, I guess DeSantis came out, probably you told him to do this since you're his political strategist and said that he would pardon Trump. And so Peter Ducey asked Joe Biden, if that DeSantis had came out and said that when he wins president, he is going to pardon Trump. Had Biden given any thoughts on it? And he just laughed hysterically and walked off. It was very funny. I, I thought it was funny. I just had something come across here, and I, and I do have some current events, but on, I had it popped up on my phone. Truth Social, Chinese fighter jet intercepted a U.S. Air Force plane over the South China Sea. That's lovely. No, there's nothing, nothing good that will come from that. Well, it's on true social, so it may be fake news. It might be. So my my current events, and, and this may not be of any interest to anybody, but it was of great interest to me, so I'm going to speak about it. Uh-huh. Chase, my youngest son, and I decided that we were going to go and judge a cattle show and a sheep and goat show in southern Alabama. So we left last Thursday and made a road trip of it, stopping at every roadside attraction, zoo, safari park, anything we could. On the way back, Ryan, we we were the proud captures of a gray rat snake that we found on the road. Yes, I'm very well aware. Oh, it was so good. It was a great event. Many, many roadside kill armadillos. It, it was a fantastic trip, including truck stop Bucky's. I know you're kind of spoiled with Bucky's there in Texas, but. I just don't see the appeal in Bucky's either, but that's just me. It, it's crazy. The appeal to me is the interesting portion of it that it is so crazy busy 
and so popular. And and I, I like it. I don't dislike it at all. And I, I think there's some great beef jerky. I think there's some neat things about it, but um, it, it has to be making a lot of money and doing, doing very, very well. So anyway, Chase and I went to uh, Southern Alabama to the Pike County Memorial Day blowout. Judge cattle all day Saturday and then sheep and goats on Sunday. And in the process, had a chance to stop and visit an old family friend. Ryan, I, I believe, and I, and I could be wrong on this, I might have found a Brahmin heifer that I got pretty excited about that used to win some show down there as a little bitty calf. Mm-hmm. But she she was was very unique. The show was very well, I, and I want to throw this out there. When you have 150 kids in cattle showmanship and then many, many heifers to come through the ring and steers, the, sh- the show staff down there, we talk about this all the time, Ryan, that if they can get them to the ring for you and in and out, it's going to make things go so, so much faster. And I know you all so well. When you're waiting one, two, three, four, five minutes for that next class to come in, you start to get fidgety. More than fidgety, but that's a nice way to describe it. <laughs> okay. But the, this this was amazing. I've never and, and I don't know I, I don't know I don't know how the families that were showing cattle took to it. But the the one of the guys in charge of lining up classes, Ryan, he had enough space. He would have two to three classes set and ready in the holding arena in their little section, ready to come in. You you would be all in on this one, just in and out. Really, really good. So I, I appreciate those kind of things. And show managers out there, it, it does make a difference on flow and the mindset of, of that judge, all of those kind of things. So I enjoyed my my road trip with Chase, and I, I did not take in any current events, worldly news. No, I, I did not know about Gay Pride Month. I knew nothing about the politics. I did see your girlfriend on Fox News right before we jumped on here talking about artificial intelligence, I think. But it, it did not make any sense. Well, she's probably trying to talk about anything because both Joe and Speaker McCarty had announced that they had come to a resolution on the debt ceiling bill, and now they don't think that's the case. So they announced they had it, now they don't. Right. Did Joe? Do you know if Joe compromised? Like you said, he would not compromise at all. Yeah, he did. He did compromise and all this other stuff, and they both like patting themselves on the back. And then this morning. It only takes three Republicans, I guess, in Congress to make this not work. And Chip Roy from Texas was like 6 a.m. in the morning. Like, no, we have not. This is not. I'm not doing it. And there are others and all this other stuff. And then magically after that, I've heard nothing else about the debt ceiling all day. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Hmm. And so, again, I am not... I don't know if this, I, I because when Joe and McCarty were there talking about how the Republicans win and Joe was talking about how they won and all this other stuff, I knew that the Republicans and Democrats were both claiming victory and the only people that were going to lose were the American taxpayers and all this nonsense. But if this fails and this does not get passed, this was my fear with McCarty being elected speaker. Right here. This this type of thing, because you can hate Nancy Pelosi, and I think she's a terrible human being who has done shady, terrible, horrible, probably illegal things while she's in office. She never took a bill to the floor that she didn't have the votes. Illegal, probably. She never took a bill to the floor when she didn't have the votes. She could she could gather and count them, couldn't she? Yeah. So that this this was my problem. He comes out last night. Everything's good. Now, we don't know. You talked about this long ago, many, many, many times. Dwelled on it, actually, that even if he gets the speakership, he'll never gather them all. Yep. And that was your that was your words. Yep. And, and I just and this is the first kind of big bipartisan thing. And here we are. And I mean, if the president comes out and says that it's one thing, that's him trying to push, you know, do, put pressure on all this that when the speaker comes out he's the leader he's republican he's the opposing you know admin party of the white house if he comes out and says that he should have his shit in check and obviously he did not i i don't doubt it's a difficult job yeah but he thought like he literally embarrassed himself publicly all over the world to get the job 
Like yes. no politician has been that embarrassed on worldwide TV. How many forty-seven votes, whatever it took to get him there? Yeah, no. So don't tell me it's a hard job. He knew what it was. I have no sympathy, none. I'm with you. I think it's time for positive news. That was my current events. See, I had so many. You did. You just did you not did. believe me. I I just took a road trip to Alabama, and Chase and I had some good family time. And and you know what? That was better than watching any news. I I enjoyed that trip as much as any. Uh huh. And you never told them what you did with your snake. You started with the snake story, and then you never wrapped that up. We we cannot discuss that because of crossing state line. Issues. Then why did you bring the snake story up that, that you we, captured we, the snake? The first first time I've ever even seen a gray rat snake, and we were able to to capture it along the road. And as we're capturing this, Chase was very intent on looking at the snake to try to not get bit. And guess what he was standing in? I don't know. A red ant hill. Oh, that's good. <laughs> It was a mess. Very entertaining for a little while. But no, it was a very, very good trip. What do you have for BTR JLA? Okay. I saw I saw buckles. I I got to sign some BTR JLA belt buckle cases. All it was very, very popular in the South. Well, there you go. The south of Alabama, that is. This is the final week that we're highlighting the junior division, and we are doing junior goats. And in first place is Ashley Poling of West Virginia with 270 points. In second place is Cabell or Cabell Knotts of West Virginia. West Virginia is the top three with 266 points. Third place is Boone Knotts, also from West Virginia. Fourth place is Briscoe Black from Texas. Fifth place is Hadley Hensley of Indiana. Sixth place is Carson Kirksey of Texas. Seventh place is Paisley Carlson, former or first all around champion of Oakland, Orland. Sorry, not Oakland, California. Eighth place is Mason Trump. I like that last name of Arizona. Ninth place is Colt Bear of Virginia. And 10th place is Dakota Rowe of California. Excellent. Pretty well mm-hmm. spread out. Uh, it goes from 270. To 137, so pretty close. Hmm, not, but not bad. Well, plenty no. of shows yet to come, and as as the- we're only halfway through, so. And I would. I don't, l- I don't think we're halfway through on show numbers, though. Just halfway through chronology. No, we're just halfway through the year. No, all the the majority of the shows are in the summer or fall, and for some reason, I I don't know why, and I've never understood this. It doesn't, other than probably. Very few states. December is a very large month for shows for some reason. I, I've never understood that with Christmas and the weather, but it is still. But yeah, but um, we would like to highlight one of our sponsors, and uh, it is Leonard Truck and Trailer. And no one has been a greater friend to the BTRJLA than Leonard Truck and Trailer and the Clint Leonard family. And this year, they have already pledged to be a corporate sponsor a national award sponsor, and they're going to be a multiple regional sponsor for 2023. And at Leonard Truck and Trailer, they are dedicated to providing the best service, selection, and value. Their efforts are focused on meeting and exceeding their customers' expectations every day because we know that the, their, that Leonard Truck and Trailer's continued success relies on our ability to satisfy every customer's need. We are committed to being your one-stop shop trailer source with the largest selection of trailers in the nation, on-the-spot financing, custom vinyl department, in-house warranty department, and comprehensive parts and services. This is why it is imperative that we have proven ourselves to be the only place you will ever need to shop for your trailer needs. And again, they were by far and away the largest sponsor for 2022 for the BTR JLA, and they have stepped up in a huge way in 2023. So thank you, Leonard, Clint Leonard family, Leonard Truck and Trailer. If you'll need a trailer, please, please consider them. Thank you very much, Leonard Truck and Trailer. Showfresh H2O is a valued partner in making BTR happen each and every week. It is simple. Show stock are less likely to consume city water that is treated with chlorine than water that would be from your well at home or water that you bring with you or any of those type of things. If you're in a situation you're not hauling water from home, 
It's very simple. Add show fresh H2O, neutralizes the chlorine. This is a quantifiable result. They either drink or they do not drink. So just very, very simple. If you use show fresh H2O, most livestock will drink more water when on the road. Show fresh H2O can be purchased at your local farm store, supply trailer, or swampfox.com. Today's title. Trending now, the goat division, the goat species. <laughs> We do have a little adjustment. Yeah, well, and again, uh, for anybody that knows, uh, we, we've said this a thousand times, but uh, it is very difficult to get mine and Dale's and Clifton's schedules all to work once a week, and then you add in a guest, and it makes it even, I mean, obviously it quantifies that, and we had one lined up, and then they had a family medical emergency about three hours before we were going to record. And so we were kind of at a loss what to do. We tried to contact some other guests that we had planned for the other species and nobody could get on for this shorter notice. But since that trending episode in the series, I had multiple, multiple people tell me how they excited they were for it, how much they loved the first one, all this other stuff. We are just going to trudge right along, and Dale, you are going to have to be not only the co-star host, but you're also going to have to be the goat guru for the day. So you you can ask me the questions. Yeah, I'm. A, you you've read. Today, you, today is all about goat. all of it is on the weight of your shoulders, Dale. I'm I'm ready. Okay. I've been I've been looking at goats, raising goats, just about all my life. Yes, I'm very very well aware of that. Or maybe maybe the past fifteen years. I'm not. I'm I was going to say I don't know about your whole life, but I mean, you know, I I think we should start this off and and all stop and just take one second to think back as far as you can. We're going to use use a guinea pig, Ryan. As far yeah. as you can, and visualize one of the very first goats you can remember seeing in a show ring. If you ever it's, seen a goat in a show ring, uh, I well, I won the state fair, so and let's be honest, what did that goat look like? She was solid red. No, and, not her color. No, more of a physical description that we, as we would describe one in the ring. So know. she was, she was one of the very first brought over from. Didn't they come from Africa? South Africa. South yes. Africa. Okay, See, maybe close. maybe some came from New Zealand. No, no. It was when you they first. Yes, yeah, South Africa, and so anyway, she was solid red, had a little bit of white on her, but she was, and. She was probably mixed, to be honest, because she was not typical boar goat looking, but she wasn't anything like they look like now. I mean, she was she looked like just kind of like a racy goat, like a, not a normal goat that we see or not even more, but a little advanced. But yeah, nothing, nothing like this. And the, I mean, she was just goatish looking. I can't really, I mean, you know, you go back to those. Uh, the th the things that I find funny is you, you go back to those very old silhouettes when we first started showing goats and they, you know, made silhouettes for trophies and ribbons and banners. She kind of looked like that. <laughs> but anyway. A, a very a very stereotypical, traditional yeah. goat. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's it. Probably, I'm going to say when, when the boars came over, about all they could cross them with, or a lot of it was dairy goat, and that made her a little racier, right? Took right. some muscle out. But if we if we think about that first goat we saw in the show ring, even even if it's some of the younger crowd that that was just five or six years ago, each and every year we're making so much progress that if if I go back and look at some of our Louisville champions, let, let's go all the way back to like 2013. Sure, really at that time thought it was a great goat. Today probably wouldn't cut it. Wouldn't even be close to to making the, the cut at, at, a, at a national show. So under under those circumstances, when they came from from South Africa, they are a very Ryan. You're going to love this part. They were probably functional and practical, and would grow and take care of themselves and survive pretty well. Mine did, because yes. she didn't get a whole lot of attention here. I'm going to be real <laughs> honest. So we we had very functional goats, and I promise you, and and for our listeners, hopefully this this will make sense to you. Mother Nature's view of what a goat should look like or any animal a lot of the time and what we believe they should look like in the show ring are vastly different, vastly, vastly different animals. 
Um, with that said, there was a lot of change that has been made from those original traditional South African boar goats. And I'm not saying change for the better from a commercial perspective or a practical perspective, but change for the better that all of a sudden we made goats look more similar to other show species. And consequently, we have junior exhibitors that began showing goats. And this all started right there in Texas. Ryan, you you were probably one of the early ones. I'm I'm going to assume oh, yeah. to be showing goats, not not trying to show a lady's age, nothing like oh, that. Oh, I only did it once, and they made me. I'm I'm not gonna lie. It was not a good. It was not a good situation. <laughs> and, and then, my and, my parents got into the goat thing because they thought they were gonna make all this money because it was brand new and all this other stuff. And so, and we actually got involved with another very high profile cattle family who brought them in who got this stuff kicked off and so that we they formed this thing here in crockett called the east texas boar goat connection and we had all these goats running amok and whatever (laughs) and uh uh, anyway i did show one only one i did win and i did tell them if i did not win they would all be dead so they better get this right but yeah no uh my my favorite thing and it did all start in texas whatever my, my my favorite story to tell And we're not getting to the trend part, but we will. But I have to show the story because it's hilarious. So my mom used to have this big, huge show in the summer called Belt Buckle Bonanza. And uh, I I was graduate. I was in college, early college, and I was there helping with the show. And so we it it was like kind of like a major livestock show. You pull in, you go to the stalling trailer, you say what you have and check in all the stuff. So this, I'll never forget this. I sent out there at the stall trailer trying to avoid doing something productive probably. But this brand new Cadillac shows up. It's got paper plates on it, all this stuff. And this very nice dressed lady gets out. She walks in and she says uh, that she needs to know where to unload her goat. And we can see what she's in. You know what I'm saying? And we said, oh, not a problem. So we, goats, stall your own. Because this was the first year that Cherie was having a goat show of any kind. Stall your own. When you come back with your goat, just drive down there. And there's right behind the horse stalls, there's the goat stalling area. You can pick wherever you want to be. She's like, no, I have my goat with me. And we're like, huh? And sure enough, in the back of this brand new caddy with leather interior paper plates, there was this goat. And I literally got on my golf cart and started calling everybody I could find so they could watch this. I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. It is crazy. We we still, and, and I, I promote this a little bit, if we have a Suburban or SUV that you can get a large dog carrier in the, in the back and it's hot or cold out, I would prefer people, if they're just picking up one young sale size goat throw it in there and go perfect perfect situation you are there, the reason i experienced this a couple of weeks ago aren't you i might this have, is your I, fault this is possible this it is was a possible. sheep though it wasn't a goat there was a sheep oh. in a dog carrier i'm not yes. joking if they're small enough to fit this one was not small enough to fit it, it did not need to happen well let, let's go back on to on to the the goat trending um so the first ones that came over uh as ryan and i discussed ryan you you did not probably want to show a goat no um, did not at all i can i can promise you those in the north held out much much longer and it would have been for kids showing sheep cattle or hogs that would have been the most embarrassing thing in the world is to show a goat early on um somehow they started making them a little bit better in texas and more kids started showing them and this was before the rest of the world even even knew that there was a show goat. They were they were getting all over it in, in Texas, getting numbers to grow. It probably grew as quick as anything at any any time. Extremely, fast. yeah, fast. I mean, it, fast. it blew up. It blew up down there. It took a while before it took over the north, and I, I don't think it took over outside of Texas at any level until the goats got good enough, or we put enough hair on them, or decided to fit them like cattle, or whatever we could do. Once they started looking more like show livestock, families that showed other species would cross over and maybe also show a goat. And it no longer was embarrassing. And then it evolved a little further. Not only has it gone from from the back seat to the front seat, but very trendy to show a goat. And it still holds on today. And the best way to quantify this is just darn goats are expensive to, to purchase right now. Good goats have been expensive for a very long time. And that tells me that there's there's more families that want to show a good goat than there are good goats available. 
So very popular. Um, I think it fell off a little bit in numbers in Texas. It's probably continued to grow in, in most of the other states, but Texas still has a dominant number of goats shown. I, I don't, I can remember close to a thousand at some of the Texas majors, maybe over a thousand market goats being shown. It, it's, it's insane. The numbers that, that you're looking at. Um, with that said, they're on a very steep curve, Ryan, what year would you, would you have shown your goat? Let's not going to talk about that, but moving on. <laughs> okay. So with that, it was, it was not that long ago. We'll say Ryan. That's but right. It was like three or four years ago. Thank you. From the, from the time they came into this country until now is a very short period. And we've had far fewer generational intervals for specific selection pressure to be applied. In, in other words, we haven't had time to make them look more like show stock. And, and again, I want to speak very clearly. As we try to make them look like other animals, things that Mother Nature did not intend, we probably lose. No, we don't. We, we lose production. We lose growth. We lose a lot of things that a goat was meant to be. But the end result is a cool-looking animal that, that fits that mold that we call the show ring. And... Ryan, we talked about with Cade last week, the maturity and the age advantages on those pigs. Well, guess what? As we, as we progress in the goats and we breed them to be just a little more moderate, we can show them longer and longer. And guess what? We get some bone, we get some more muscle, we open up that skeleton. A lot of things come into the goat side of things, just like you do in pigs and other species, that it's becoming more popular. And, and again, we're going against performance and rate of gain and all those things that at one one time meant something and were practical we've we've ditched that and i i have never held back on this podcast i don't know that i've ever just talked about goats specifically maybe answered a question or two but we my my theory and philosophy and and we're primarily involved with goats and cattle and i want to keep the cattle as sound and functional and resembling an animal that would work in the real world in many environments on the goat side. I threw that out the window because it it does not fit what's winning on the national. That's why I say you're a hypocrite. Yes. But I, are you a hypocrite? If you admit it, if you say, I I'm aware that goats are very impractical cattle, I'd like to make them as practical as possible. Anyway, moving on. That's another podcast. It is. So we're this on a is supposed steep, to be about trends, Dale. Very, trends. There's very, very steep curve is what I was getting at. There's changes being made all the time. The trend the past few years, probably from the beginning, the boar goat was bred to a dairy goat because we had nothing else to breed them to. Maybe an Angora goat, different things, but we took a lot of muscle. There, there's some muscle in that, that African boar goat, but we bred some of it out trying to just make more goats. And goats by nature are pretty light muscled, pretty narrow, pretty narrow chested, pretty flat sided, wrinkly hided, sway backed, bad hipped, just all those things. Everything you can think, every negative term, Ryan, that you use, you could just about attach to a real world original goat. We've progressed a great deal from that image. And I think that when we, we think back to that image, we, we run away from it as fast as we can because that's, that's not what's popular. That's not what kids want to drag into the show ring. It just isn't. And I think it's all about getting those kids, getting them goats in in their barn, getting them to the barn, the family time, everything, the responsibility, the work ethic, all those things that come along with it. And we've, we've achieved that. And to move forward, we've selected so hard for muscle, 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 because a goat by nature has no muscle. We've accomplished over the years, I think in the past two to three years, goats that probably in the show ring now have enough muscle. Well, once we have enough muscle, it's hard for some breeders to turn directions and not just single trait breed for muscle because that's made them money. That's worked for them. People would come in, they'd find those heavy muscle goats, they'd buy them, they'd show them, they, they likely have some success with them because there weren't very many heavy muscle goats in the world. Now that there's a bunch of heavy muscle goats out there, Ryan, what do you sort on? Oh, the same thing I've always sorted on, but I'm I, I, I'm not. <laughs> same thing as other species. I mean, I think I think yeah. Let's 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 make sure there's plenty of muscle. We don't want to throw that out the window. But if we've got a, a class or we're at the top end of that class and they all have a significant amount of muscle, we we probably need to look at some of the other things: the skeletal build, the the show ring appearance, balance. Some of the exact same things. And I think if you could take what 
we talked about last week with Cade in Apply It to Goats. I know you're thinking, well, pig and a goat, well, that that doesn't work. But no, it really does. Body proportions, balance, bone, or you want to talk about hair. For the most part, when we talk about bone and a goat, it's just whichever one's hairy or legged. We, we give them the pass that they're, they're, they're heavy boned. So all of those things come into play. And I think from here forward, it's critical that, I, I guess, from my breeder's perspective, when, when Craig and I and my wife, Holly, sit down and try to say, okay, where, what, what direction are we going with the genetic base that we want to work with? There is no question. And we, we've been on this path maybe a little bit longer than just the past couple of years. But I think we better think past. Okay, let's let's assume we we've gotten to that point on muscle that's pretty good. Let's make sure that there's some skeletal integrity there. Let's make sure when they get off that goat that it doesn't completely fall apart, or when you ask it to go into motion that it can actually travel. Because I think the future in the goat world or in the goat arena, if we finally have enough muscle in them, we have to start making them look like those really good sheep or those really good cattle or really good pigs. That, that have those body proportions, that everything's in balance, everything's in check, and top it all off with, they look just as good in motion as they do propped up. We have such good showmen out there in the lamb and goat ring that when they get these things propped up, they can look pretty darn good. And then all of a sudden, we, we let off them to go into motion, and we go sway back, and we drop our head. Everything goes the wrong direction. And I, I don't know moving forward that that's going to be as tolerated maybe as it has been in the past. Ryan, if, if I were to say, here's, here's the future in the, in the goat arena, I, I don't, I, I don't, you know, I don't like to compliment you, but the goats that you've been using the past several years, at least two, three years anyway, as far as I've been paying attention, I believe that's the direction that most goats are going to go. And I've always told everybody that I've tried to work with when, when people are, are asking, well, how do I evaluate a goat? I admit my own flaws. When we went out to try to find a goat herd to purchase, I was trying to figure out what people wanted a goat to look like. Our manager, Craig, my wife, Holly, were looking at them as just livestock. And if we were to treat these and evaluate them more like livestock, that makes it very simple. And we make progress and we go, go the right direction. I still don't know what a, what a true goat person wants a goat to look like, but I know what good livestock look like. And I think, Ryan, you've, you've gravitated across species. Can, you, you can put it in better words than I do. We can talk about different trends and different species and how these animals are built differently, but aren't you still selecting for the same basis? I, I, again, I think that no matter what I'm judging, breeding or market, my priorities do not shift, do not change. Nothing changes. Species, regardless species. of species, regardless yes. of anything, they stay the same. And I, I I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Obviously, I get asked to judge a lot, so it's something is working. But I, I have just never, it, it is what, I admire and all of the species and you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that like maybe I am more impressed when a sheep or a pig is incredibly, incredibly sound with still all the muscle and power because you don't find them as much, but it, I mean, there are, when I judge different things, maybe I find things more impressive because you don't see them so much in that species, but my priorities don't shift. And what I love and what I loathe does not shift regardless of the species. But I, I think what you're saying is right. And Kate touched on it last week. The reason that muscle is always going to be there is, is because it's the most easily identifiable trait for everybody, whether you're judging, selling, buying, showing, everyone can identify which one's the heaviest muscle. And so I think you're right that you're there on goats. And now I do think that maybe it is time that we look to different areas. Uh, and again, everyone here knows that I am very, very secure in what I like and what I judge for. And I think everybody else should be too. I'll be real honest with you, Dale, and this isn't going to be popular, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think in the goat deal, because it still is the newest, and 
even though y'all have made greater strides than probably any other species in a smaller time frame or window, I'm still not positive that if y'all got all you masterminds together and goat leaders in one room, y'all would all even come close to agreeing on what the ideal goat is. And so I think that allows for a lot more wiggle room and stupid shit to happen in the goat show ring than any other. I I would agree with that. And I want to take it back because you said it, you, you, you explained it so well that when you're out there, irregardless of species, there's a certain kind that, that you, you love and that you gravitate towards. And I'm afraid because there's fewer judges out judging goat shows that have actually been in the trenches, the goat trenches, and they're out there rather than taking their knowledge from the other species and just applying it to goats, which you've, you've shown a goat or two, or you've been around them. You've watched plenty of goat shows, but it's not difficult for you. You just apply the same principles from what you've been in the trenches with, what you've been exposed to the majority of your life and apply it to making selections on, on what are good goats. And I think people that stand out there and do it like that do very well. Irregardless, and again, we've talked about it. It doesn't have to be the same kind of goat that I want, as long as you're consistent, as long as you describe it well, and that's what you believe in. The biggest problem that we run into, and I'm going to try to tie this into where I think the trend is, and that this complicates it. We have somebody out there, and and you can't expect. I I, I prefer livestock people to come in that have multiple species behind them in judge goat shows necessarily than just a person that all of they've ever been around is goats and may not have been exposed to other species. Some of those do a great job, but in general, I can relate to those livestock people that jump into the goat arena, like in sort of similar to you, they just apply the principles from whatever species they're comfortable with. And it really works. The problem that I think we run into is we get into that goat arena and we don't have a lot to fall back on to, or some of the judges on true goat experience. And they try to second guess what a goat is supposed to look like or what somebody else thinks rather than just sorting those animals. And that in itself, Ryan, as you mentioned, that opens the door for so many different directions. And the fact that as breeders, and I think a lot of species, you can get breeders together and they're going to argue a lot. But I think the fact that as breeders, not as much as y'all would probably can't agree (laughs) on a single ideal animal, but It complicates it even further that we have judges out there in the arena rather than sorting in in what they truly believe, they're sorting what they think they should be. Does that make any sense? No, I I think it makes sense. And you bring a point that is a whole nother podcast that I could spend hours on. And you're talking about people who are in the trenches judging versus people aren't in the trenches, all this. And just a brief point on that. I have fed, shown, whatever, every species of livestock there is. I have, we, we raised goats. We've raised cattle. We were involved in a sheep flock at one time. I never raised a pig, but my father has all this other stuff. And just on that point, I, I, you hear people all the time. Oh, I don't want to see judging team people, judging team kids or coaches judge. I want to see people that have real world experience. And then all this other stuff, I'd say that's all bullshit. It, none of that makes <laughs> a good judge. None of it. Absolutely no, none. I, that is I, a I, whole nother podcast. But I just wanted to bring yeah. that up because the real world experience or judgment, none of that makes a great judge. Totally different things do. I think the deal is with ghosts is just like you're saying because it still is new. And a, a lot of people don't. The, the, for, how are there people out there raising show goats? Judging, yes. But I would say in that species more than any, even though politics is probably as a high of any in that species, I don't think it's as much as has to do with only goat breeders judge. Uh, I think it is just like you say, not everyone is convinced on what makes for an ideal goat. So there's, just like I said, more room for stupid shit and they can go off and whatever and nobody's really going to hang them because they can't really argue because I don't know if that has been as well defined in this species as the others when 
a truly inferior animal wins, if that happened in another species, people would be like, with pitchforks and torches and nooses, I don't see that as much in this deal. And I think it's because it's still relatively new and we don't have that defined. But on on the trends, and since you sell them, you're in a weird spot here, and I get that. And and so I'm not going to put not, you... Not, not only do I sell them, I am I have a sale going on as we're recording. Okay, well, anyway, I'm, I'm going to try not to, like, put you in the firing squad as much as possible, but I, I'm just going to tell you that these are the trends that I have noticed when I have been judging. First and foremost, I, I and, and this is a fitting trend, I think that because every species is tried to add bone, and Kate touched on that, everybody can tell which one's the biggest legged, then y'all are trying to get them shaggier legged, you are trying to you know, not only breed for that, but when you fit them, every almost every goat show that I go to that is fit, there is going to be an animal come in there that has god awful twined legs. And when I mean god awful, it looks like they put a cast on this animal's back legs and front legs or one or the other and sent them in the ring. And Jesus Christ, that trend needs to stop. And again, I'm going to say, if you can twine and you get or add hair and all this and still make it look professional and somewhat natural, then that is probably going to get you noticed. You're going to get noticed this other way, but in the completely opposite way that you want to be noticed. And I, I, I'm sure we brought this up here, but we're talking about trends and goats and we're talking about... That trend, if you can't do it, do not hurt yourself and try. I don't think it matters which species, but goats, it, maybe because it's but new. But it's the worst of goats. We're putting more emphasis on leg hair, so there's more hair to start fitting. And if you don't have it, you better build it. All of those things. And, and just like we talked about last week, and, and Ryan brought this up, and, and this was a direction that I, I was going to take this, skin and hair in a goat. There is no question that that is becoming valuable. Ryan, if we go back just a few years, and I'm going to use Texas as our example because there's more goats shown there than anywhere else. Go back three, four, five years, there were very, very few goats. That's five years ago that hit the Texas majors that had much for leg hair. And if they did have much for leg hair, very few of them had actually worked that leg hair, trained that leg hair, and tried to get it to stand up on its own because we, we at most of those majors, we cannot fit them with adhesive. Um, they're just, they, they look like slick legged Suffolk sheep. Okay. Go back. And, and I know you're not old enough, but I can remember this. I can remember when lambs were, when, when it was, if you went to that champion market lamb drive with the Suffolk odds are you were probably going to win. And now you First. go to that champion market lamb drive with the Suffolk. Where are you? Uh, you're not you're doing very not well, probably. Very <laughs> I, I, will, I will tell you this. The first that. time I ever won my county fair sheep show, it was exactly what you just expressed. The Suffolk had no black, no leg hair, nothing, whatever. And that sucker won anyway. And, so, and, yeah. and, it, was, and it was accepted just like five, six, seven, oh, yeah. eight years ago. Goats with no leg hair were accepted because they, they all pretty much were that way. Now you've got goats with a bunch of shag on them and you, you pull one in next to it that has no leg hair, irregardless. And, and Kate made the point, there's no true big difference if you measure that carcass and, and open it up and cut that leg in half and measure that circumference of bone. Even though there's very minimal difference in actual bone, the skin and the hair will give you the illusion that there's a huge difference. In just about every goat judge out there, if you've got a shaggy legged one, they're going to call it big boned. And it just is what it is. Call it shaggy legged, call it big legged. It's probably more accurate. Some will still call them big boned. Um, but just think about today. Here's here's the best example that I can use. And we're right on that that line. That if you think you can win at a state fair or a national level show with a slick legged lamb, you've lost your mind. We are there, in my opinion, here the next year, two years. It oh, I just, think you're there. Already. It just is, yeah, it is, yeah. You're there. I'm not saying there won't be a judge out there that might grab one, but it's not very likely. 
Uh, no, it's more likely. I think, I, think I don't think you're giving the goat people enough credit, including yourself. You're <laughs> there. Not. You're there. <laughs> it, so, so, so that the and there are still plenty of goats out there that have no leg hair. They they oh, yeah. they aren't bred to have it. They're never going to have it. It just is what it is. And just like the sheep are that way. But what the breeders did in the lamb side is is they had to breed for it. I can tell you, and again, I'm I'm a, a touch uncomfortable talking about some of these things because I, I am in this business. Yeah, you're going to get real uncomfortable when I start talking here in a minute since you are uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. So we always, we, we put pictures up that get a lot of attention on social media and, and we have from the very beginning. I wish I could take credit for putting this kind of leg hair on them. I, I cannot. Uh, we purchased this this herd of goats from Kelly Meat Goats out of, out of Texas. Search for two years to try to figure out what we thought were the best genetics and the most unique and all of those things. And here they were. I have never selected for leg hair because it was always there. Just about everything that I worked with was so line bred. There was very little difference in how much leg hair they had. So I didn't have to worry about straying off here the past few years and selecting for that. We could continue to focus on skeletal build, show ring presence, muscle, round rib, all these other things where there, there are some situations where there's some pretty darn good goats out there if they had leg hair. And all of a sudden, when you try to put leg hair on them or select a breeding animal because they have a bunch of leg hair, you're probably giving up something else. It just, it just is what it is. But you will not, to my knowledge, win one of these major shows without it because it, whether the judge intentionally does it or not, just like in the lamb show ring, nobody, nobody out there judging the major shows using a slick, legged lamb the dynamic of that animal changes so much when you when you put hair on those legs it just isn't going to compete with those that are shaggy yeah and i mean all those points ring true and just like it again probably another podcast but anyway this whole leg shag whatever all this other stuff i I judged a sheep show on sunday and i probably only mentioned three times whether one was too frail, or and I mentioned one was really stout, whatever. Because again, in my opinion, if you really, if you just look past whether it's goat or sheep, if you, if you look past the like bull, shag, whatever you want to call it, they're probably all very similar with it, minor differences in terms of the amount of bone that they have. And so that's that. That's another podcast, but I agree. That is something that is not going to change. Uh, I think an- another trend is because, like you said, we, we've got all we've got them as muscular as we can get them. I think, or close, oh close. My. Uh, uh, another trend that has surfaced is, for some reason, like we in the, I'm gonna shoot out two of them here, and then I've got one other after that, but. We we want them, and I y'all know that I love one to have that cool front that sits so high up on the top of the whatever neck and all this stuff, and I want that. But we've got this stout muscular thing that now we're trying to put this little bitty skinny neck on, and when we do that, all we do is when it gets to the extremes that it are, we're, we're getting to where they break. Or they get too straight, or they get outside themselves, all this other stuff, because you can't put all of this naturally into every animal. Is are, are there exceptions to every rule? Yes. But so my point is, and with that, we're also wanting to get them they keep wanting them so wide through the front end and all this other stuff. In my opinion, not when I sort, but when lots of people sort and I'm okay with it if that sorter is consistent all the way through. If they want one that you can drive a semi-truck through the front end and they do it every single class and that's what they truly like, I'm okay with that. But my opinion on all this is you're just literally structure is completely going to hell. You, you've just thrown it out the window. Okay, and an, again, an analogy you're not going to get comfortable because I, these are my <laughs> thoughts. And again, I'm not telling anybody what to sort for. And like I said, if that is what you truly like and you're consistent in every class and doing it, I have no problems with it. I'm not going to agree with you, but I'm not going to say that you did a bad job or inconsistent as long as you do that. 
<sighs> Agreed yes. completely. Think about think about when we when we made the hogs when we went went and opened that that front end and that shoulder or that chest floor up so much a few years ago. We took those hogs and got so many of them outside themselves. And Cade talked about this a little bit. He thinks there's as many now, but we do a better job of managing and feeding and trying to keep that shoulder tucked in. And there's a very fine line. We want to open that chest floor up because as we open the chest floor up, we can expand that that rib just a little bit. But at the same time, if we haven't learned a lesson in the goats, if we go back and in, in so far, and we should have, have qualified this earlier, we're talking about market weathers or weather breeding genetics, not full blood so far. And we, we're not even touching on the full bloods today because I No, I, I don't have any trends for the full no, blood people. I'm we, sorry. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't do it justice. So I apologize. We're talking about market weathers and weather yes. dams. Yes. That's it. So with with that said, if if you have watched many full blood shows or percentage shows, no. Over the years, we've had some of those those full blood goats, they're so wide, bulldog wide up through their front end and their chest, and they're about half as wide when you get back to their ass. And, and it, it wedges completely the wrong direction. And when you study those shoulders, and some people call them outside themselves, you can call it a lot of different things. And some will argue that nothing, there, there isn't such a thing as outside the skeleton. Well, from a technical standpoint, maybe not. But when you look at those that are super wide up front, and if we have judges selecting strictly on chest width or making that the number one priority, breeders are going to breed for that. And all of a sudden, the way to make them wider up there is you loosen up that entire shoulder structure, and then all of a sudden we can we can expand where those front legs sit down, and those full blood people can set those front legs so wide because that shoulder's just so loose and and just it's hard for me to it's hard for me to even explain how it doesn't hold itself together in a tight neat package where the point of the shoulder lays in real real nicely, but we get them. I, I guess the best way to explain it is almost like we. We take their body and then stick those those front legs as far, just patch them along the side, just slap them up alongside the body rather than intertwining them in and connecting them into that shoulder. And and I know that's confusing, but that that's the best audio I can give for that that particular look. Um, and it's it's an issue, and I, I think that's good if we can make them wider and still keep them sound and functional. But when we get them that loose up in that shoulder to make them that wide. Just about every time we're going to bust coming out of that shoulder really, really bad. We're oftentimes going to get narrower as we go back into into what we used to talk about the more expensive cuts on a lamb and assumably a goat. So we we have to be we have to be careful with this. And it's almost like if we we push the envelope so far, we're selecting for a skeletal defect. And we did it in the pigs. We've done it in the full blood goats, and we're we're flirting on the edge of it right now. And in the market weathers and the weather dams. And it is what it is. We've, we, we raise some, Ryan. I, I have some that, that go too far. And the reason that, that we, we hit that is we, we try to open them up to that, that real fine line. Let's get them as wide as we can, but keep that shoulder construction all assembled correctly. And, it, and it's very, very difficult to open them way up and keep that, that all happening. With more generations of selection pressure, we're going to be able to do that like other species have been able to do that. But that, that has been something that, that we've pushed or has been pushed a little bit in the show ring for the past couple of years. I, I am convinced, and I will argue this to the day I die, that if you want to know what direction the goats are going, just look at the other species, specifically um, sheep and, and probably cattle more, more so than pigs. But I think you can look at all of them because we do have people like, such as Ryan, and such as others that judge multiple species that are that are very high profile, and that's helping bring all these things together. We want these animals proportional. We want to hit all of those fundamental. The basics need to be in play. We need to have a goat that has enough muscle. We need a goat that's opened up enough in the skeleton. We need a goat that's skeletally correct, and then let's put that freak neck on them. Let's put that extra shag on them. Let's make all those things that are so hard to get sometimes those unique freaking nature pieces. Once we meet all the basics, throw all the rest of it at it. You, you, you can, and that's all a bonus. Don't expect it to happen as a breeder because it's not going to happen very often. And if we just select for those freak pieces alone and forget about the fundamentals, then we, we've got our skeleton screwed up. We, we've gone a lot of different ways. So to me, looking at the big picture, we've selected heavily for muscle for years and, and rightfully so. Goats had no muscle. Now we're selecting, probably going a little further up in that that chest width and shoulder where we're going to get into some more problems. 
But I think as we've made them more muscular, as we've opened up that skeleton, and there's always a purpose for it. When we go that far, it brings the average in check where you can take that average of your herd and start focusing on quality, a thin tied hide, the neck that that ties in right there at the top of that shoulder, really an arrogant presence and able to float across the ring effortlessly. All of those things are easy to select for once we get goats to a point that they're acceptable on muscle, they're acceptable on with the skeleton, they're acceptable in terms of how much shag they have on them. Then we can start focusing in on, on, on those hard to make traits. And I love hard to make traits as much as anybody because I, I'm, I'm living it every day. And it just, it, it is so hard to make those creatures in the goat world. Someone more intelligent, far more intelligent than myself is going to have to explain to me the value in an animal being wider through the floor of its chest than it is its rear legs or ass in, right? I've, I'm never going to get that. I'm not, but again, I'm going to move on. It's, it's that reverse wedge. It, it doesn't make any sense to me, but sometimes. And, and right. we've seen it in the full bloods for a very long time. Very Again, long. I just want someone to explain to me the value of that. I just need to. You there cannot, is, there, but I, there is not much value in the actual end product of a shoulder. I can promise I'm you. Not, that. I'm not talking order. about. I'm just talking about. Anyway, um, you're just talking about even a look. A yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I, I can take it all. I can take it all the way to the real world. And, and please do not. But there is no value there. Zero uh-huh. value. None. So um, I, I think that there's, and, and I'm going to let Ryan kind of kind of push a little little bit further or summarize it. But there's there's a lot of things that are exciting in, the, in this I'm goat not world. And, done. No, sorry. Well, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm I have two up. more trends that I want go, to ask go, about. Go, go, please go. And I'm I'm going I'm going to be nice on this next one, but I, I think in this this now is better in the goat deal than it's ever been. But in my opinion, for quite some time. And again, I don't know why this was other than it was the only species that had a different hip structure primarily. I think that a large majority of the goats were judged on how level their hip was. Do you agree with that to some extent? Yes. And and the may I say the difficulty with that, what comes with it? Yeah, I want you to do all that, but I I just you agree with that, that a large Yes. Portion of it was what there. Okay. And we're never going to get a goat to have a perfectly level hip. And I, I'm very aware of that. In unlike in you're closer to it in the other species than you're ever gonna be in a goat. But y'all have made great strides in that area and all this other stuff. So my question for you, because that that was definitely a trend, is and I still think it's a trend is that the closer to looking like a cattle hip you can in the goat show, then better off you're going to be in terms of levelness. Do you think that y'all have reached the point where we're, we're good there? Or do you think they're still going to continue to try to level it out even more? Explain that to me. And then I have one more and then we'll wrap up. (laughs) Okay. I think that you can make a goat level hip. I've seen level hip goats. They're called dairy goats. (laughs) <laughs> and the only way to make them that level hipped is to take all of the muscle out of them. And that's that I'm not, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a little bit You're entertaining, right. but it's, it's, it's the truth that You're you right. can go, you can find dairy goats that are dead level hip that have zero muscle. When we, we put muscle on a goat and try to get them to function out of their hip, they just, if you make that, I, I, yeah, I don't know how far to take this here. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to jump off a cliff here a little bit. So when, when we're making breeding decisions and I'm, I'm a, a student of mother nature and studying soundness, and we've got a dog running around here that I recently purchased that we talked about last week, Ryan, that is the soundest dog skeleton. No, it is not soundest skeleton creature in the world in terms of how it floats and how effortless it is. We can look at any hoof stock in nature that has to travel long distances or, or escape predators or all those They're very functional animals in nature from a movement standpoint, not our straight lines, square hips, everything we want in the show ring, because what we talk about being structurally correct in terms of our lines doesn't necessarily apply to function. And and the horse people could maybe address this even even better yet. So back to your level hip. If we put muscle in a goat, they're going to give you the illusion of a steeper hip. 
if you have a wide muscular goat that's level hipped, you've had to almost screw that hip structure up that if you truly study them, they're not going to get along real well out of those hind legs. And guess what? I'm breeding for that screwed up hip right now. I am putting emphasis on a hip structure that's not right because the judges want that level hip and they want a big old whomping ass on them. And you can't do both mechanically in a goat. So if I screw the hip up and jerk those, those pin bones all the way up and still try to keep them as thick as I can, I promise you they're going to be a little funky moving out of their hind leg. But fortunately, we don't have a lot of goat judges that are confident enough just to hammer on them for it. And <laughs> we, we oftentimes have a goat that's halfway dra- dragging through the ring. They're not leading as easily as, as you would like. And maybe you excuse the movement because it's not walking out well, whatever it may be. So you, you are correct. The other thing that, that really determines whether a goat's good hipped or not, and I've heard it so many times, if the tail's up, the judge will usually call them level hipped. If the tail's down, the hip looks horrible. I know that seems simple, stupid, but there's a lot to that. And, and yes, so, so I, I think we'll continue. To and I'm not saying level. that you're wrong on that, but that the tail being up or down has absolutely no, nothing it, it, to do it, with it how level the hip is. No, it, sh- it doesn't, but it, and it should Zero. not, but you, you hear judges, every goat that's got a tail down, they talk about it being bad hipped every single time. I'm not yes. saying it's right. It isn't. It doesn't, I, I, doesn't I, change I the hip placement at all. <laughs> It has nothing to okay. do with it. it so does yeah, not so I, I think we'll, we, we will continue to try to make show livestock, including goats, go from the point of their the apex of their shoulder into the the top of their rib cage or, or coming out of their shoulder into their top line, into their hooks and pins, and everything a straight line. I would like a little bit of sway there for flexibility purposes and looseness of skeleton, so they can actually travel and flex well. But for some reason, we still have that mindset straight out of the shoulder to the hip, straight down to the ground. Um, we like square. We like straight. Yes, they're going to continue to emphasize we want to make them level hip in the show ring. Lovely. That's, and then finally, and then this this trend, again, this is going to take somebody very intelligent to explain to me, but we're talking about trends and things, whatever. And, and I, I do think that in the GOAT deal, there are more trends out there right now that I am baffled by. I will just say, I am baffled by why it matters. But again, if it's that person and they're out there sorting, they're consistent with it, get it. I will never understand it. But this is the thing. And the skull width, sir. <laughs> okay. That That is the trend. You You use it in your selection criteria. How's that? I do not. Yes, you do. I've watched you. You did it to one of mine. You did it. I no, watched I you at a jack. Ugly skull. headed, but probably because <laughs> yes. it was too wide skulled. But yes, it was. exactly. Okay, maybe I'm the opposite yes. of this yes. trend. Okay. Yes, you are. Okay, okay. I will buy that. Um, so I I don't have a problem. And, and I, I had a judging coach um, from a neighboring school talk to me about judging pigs when I was a freshman in high school. And he talked about these pigs being wider between the eyes. And you're going to see that width carry back from their shoulder to their loin, to their hip. And it all starts at their head. And you can correlate these things. Okay. I can assure you when, when we're selecting for bucks, um, we will look at those heads. When I'm selecting bre- or making breeding decisions, or, or I, I should, should rephrase that, when I'm in Argentina selecting donors that I want to use to, to bring embryos back up to the United States. I I'm looking at their heads um, for various reasons. And on the male side, we are generally going to use a little wider skulled buck than not. Now, when it comes to a weather or a market animal, all of a sudden that that gets to be a very gray area. Does that make sense? And if you have a white headed one, you call them the ugly headed. I've heard you do it. Yeah, and then there are other people that are judging that as a positive trait. So again, I, it's just something that's out there, and well, I, I think that's I, why I brought I, it up. I, I believe there's there's a couple things coming into play. Guess what? What's something we didn't even talk about that makes a very wide head, or can make a wide head? Age. 
Yes, sir. That is correct. So age is always going to increase that skull size. Maybe it's long and narrow and big headed, but but you're going to get more width of, of skull with with some age. And and I I do believe that there's some correlation that if you want them really really wide opened up, that those wide headed ones are more likely to be opened up all the way through their skeleton than the than the narrow headed ones. That's to me that's that that just happens. So if I want to to make progression on opening the 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 chest and the forerib up and the skeleton in general, we will look at those bucks' heads and and their body, obviously, because that's what we're trying to get to. But there there is some correlation to that. Now, you not prescribing to or subscribing to the ultra wide chest and and that great big old front end and maybe a narrow ass, that doesn't work as well, maybe in, in your world. But there are some no. very good there are some very good wide skulled goats. I promise you that. And you can the ultra narrow headed goats you don't like either. You want something that's proportional, I assume. I guess my portion or my for bringing this up is like again, yes, I remember when I beat one of yours for having an ugly head. I also that was the ax was that was just one goat. of Yeah, it was just not completely not my kind at all. But anyway, next, like my thing is, is just I, I find it very interesting that in goats, I think that it is more of a trend right now that that is one of the top priorities than probably, or at least mentioned more than the other species, and that's why I brought it up. I don't agree with it particularly, and I don't care. I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't care. I'm not here to like tell other people how to sort. I just think that it's something that is higher priority list in goats than the other species. Yes, and I, I I've thought of another one here, and and I can use our sales as an example. Um, one that's that's going on right now would would call me a liar. I just just pulled it up, and it isn't doesn't isn't applying right now. But the the sale is not over yet. In goats, more than in lambs, because we either have the natural colored or the dark fiber or white. Sometimes a combination of the two. Pigs, we can get all kinds of different colors, and cattle, depending on the breed, we can we can vary it up a little bit. But in the pig ring, we talk about some calicos and we talk about some odd mark colors. And I sometimes love a those become, yes, Big they're fan. very popular. So Big where fan. where where are you, Ryan, with color in goat? Well, because I like everything that is me. I mean, I am perfectly fine with wild colored goats. Like it did. Uh, <clears throat> and, and I mean, that goes for the solid red ones, the solid black ones, the ones that, you know, were painted up all those sayings big capes whatever no, none of that really bothers me i i in it just like in cattle uh using a mini herford or a highlander or whatever i think is the best none of that bothers me there either and so i i am just because and th- we talk about a lot on here that this goes back to every judge's preferences or how they judge goes back to their environment and you know things that they have been brought up with and all this other stuff and uh, where my deal for this is is primarily when i was showing steers it was until we started slick shearing you had to have a solid black calf to win and i just railed against that whole philosophy i was like no i want to win i want to win with something other than a black one damn it because that's boring to do what everybody else does and so that that I mean I I think I think that is something nobody put that in me. That was me wanting to do something that other people couldn't accomplish by winning with a colored KF when it wasn't, you know, widely accepted. And I think that has stayed with me regardless uh in judging, in selecting and whatever, all those things. That's just something to stay with me. So again, Wild color goats do not bother me. I do not think they are very popular by the large judging pool, though. So I, I, I want to address this, and, and I could be wrong, and, and hopefully a listener will correct me, and I'm sure they will, via Facebook message or a text after they listen to this. We have more difficulty showing colored goats in the state of Texas than anywhere else in the country, and primarily under what I call the old school Texas judge that's been judging goats since pretty much the beginning. Part of it is the African South African boar goat came over with a white body and a red head. 
Yep. We started breeding dairy goats in them, and all of a sudden we got color in them. So when they see color, they're still in a mindset, and I, I get it because it happened for so many years, that if they're colored up, they're dairy goat, and if they're dairy goat influence, they don't have enough muscle. So there's a, a stigma to the colored goats that they may not have enough muscle. I can, I can argue the fact that color is trendy because if I go through all of our sales throughout, throughout the year, those goats that have color on them that are comparable to a traditional marked one, the colored goat in general is going to bring more money each time. So they're definitely more popular with the show families. Maybe that's that teenage girl picking out the goat or the, the, the kid that's going to be showing the goat, whoever it may be. They're definitely more popular with families, I think, because they're unique. And it just kind of like what you said, Ryan, it, it makes sense. I think with Northern judges in the non old school Texas judge, I think if you have a colored one, it's probably going to get noticed a little more when it comes in the ring. And this can work See. to your advantage or disadvantage. If it's a good one, easy. You're, you're there. Wow. That, that, that painted up one. He's good. You're not going to forget that one, no matter how many come in the ring. If you have that painted one up one that comes in there and he's just horrendous, oh, that's a bad paint goat. And just, it sticks. It's there. So I think it can work to your advantage or disadvantage. So if you have color, I would strongly recommend putting on a very, very good one. And I want to take it a step further. Just like I, I have not had to select for, for shag or leg hair in goats because genetically it's just been there from the very beginning for us. We, we, we darn sure don't select against it, but we don't have to worry about it. It's not. We can, we can focus on other traits. Well, guess what? We have never once selected a female or a buck because it was a certain color, but we never once selected against it. So in theory, when we come up with colored goats, people are very impressed more times than not because they're the similar quality to the traditional made goats. So I understand why there's a prejudice against maybe colored goats by some people that, that have been in this for a long time. But under our genetic selection process, there has been nothing selected for or against. And when color pops up, it's just likely to be on one of our best ones as one of our worst ones. It just is there, not selecting for or against. And we have, because we've done that, it seems like those colored genes are recessive and we're getting more and more color all the time. It's popping up quite a bit. So I think it's kind of neat. I think I don't think you need a colored goat to win a national show. I don't think you need a traditional colored goat to win a national show. I think each judge will have an opinion on that. I think if I'm taking a goat to Ryan Rash and there there's two goats that are identical in their body, identical in everything except their color, I'm going to take the colored one to him every time. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and <clears throat> I, I agree. I think you summed up that color thing very, very well. And I, I just want to give my two cents in on the Texas part. See, it should be the exact opposite because Texas has larger goat classes than any other state, major, whatever in the nation. No, no, no other place are you going to find goats of a hundred head in a class. Would you agree with that, Dale? I agree. OIE will uh, will put quite a few in a class, but the majors, the Texas majors, some of those classes are monsters. Right, and 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 all all of them are about the same size at every major. I mean, the monster class. So you should want the wild colored goat. At the Texas Major Show, so you would be one of the 10 maybe in that 100 or however many out there that looks different. But no, you're right. you, you got to be a traditional. If, if, it's, if, if it's a good one underneath the color. If it's but it, it does not work. Good. You were right. It, they, they, do not, they do not do well down here. They just Now, what, you need to re- what, what the Texas family need, families need to realize is sometimes you get some northern judges that come down there, and I don't think they'll be nearly as critical on, on the color and, and may even like it. So it, it really depends on the judge. But if we're going to make some generalizations, the last I am place the that color is popular is in Texas. No question that that is there. Well, well this was good. I hope I hope it made some sense. And and I and again, Ryan, I'm I'm going to say I, I'm happy to to do this today. And and you know, I I enjoy talking about goats. I'm a little hesitant and a touch uncomfortable because I don't want it to be come across self serving. But there's 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 a certain type of goat that I like, so that's the kind I'm going to talk about, and that's the kind we raise. So it is what it is. Take it, take it, take it with a grain of salt. And and here's what, what our thoughts were or my thoughts. Right. And in, in summing this up, and again, y'all know that I don't sugarcoat anything and I'm just very, very honest. And if you don't like it, then don't listen. But I think, and I'm, and this is not bashing. This is not being derogatory or anything else. 
I do think in goats more than any, because this series we're doing is about trends. I do think in goats more than any other species right now that there are trends, more trends that probably make zero sense to me that are popular and prioritized. And again, it it doesn't matter that they make zero sense to me, but that's just out there because I still think it is back to the basics of just two things. Number one, it's still the newest species that there is. I still think, like I said earlier, if you got all you people that are successful and do this, whatever, I think you would have a wider range in opinions of what made an ideal goat than if we did that in the other species. And number two, what Dale said at the very beginning and summed it up so well, is finally, the majority of the goats have enough muscle in them. And so now, since there's lots of them at shows that are very muscular and stout and dense, there are other things that are having to sort out who wins, who's second, who's third. And so now we have these other trends popping up that we have talked about that are sorting shows out. And uh, that's the reason why. And so, again, I I didn't want Dale to be the only person that had to talk about this. We wanted to have somebody else, but circumstances are what it was. So I appreciate Dale for being the person to do this, even though we didn't get to have another guest. And sorry that I made him uncomfortable, but you know, I like it. I'm fine. It it's no problem. It's no problem because guess what? What? It's time for something else. Oh, the thing that makes me the most uncomfortable ever question and answer is I'm assuming is what you are saying. Yeah, this is correct. Yeah. And so again, I told you last week that we did get a question and answer sponsor and it is basic animal health. And they are very proud to be our sponsor uh, for this portion. They are a providing natural solutions to your animal needs. They currently have three products available, uh, Gut Health, Show Focus, and Trailer Ride. And today we are going to highlight Show Focus. It is an all-natural focus and calming supplement. Show Focus will help your livestock focus in the show pen while remaining relaxed and comfortable. Again, we appreciate Basic Animal Health for being the question and answer sponsor. And we appreciate all they do to support because that their sponsorship is going towards the BTRJLA, not Dale's podcast, my organization. (laughs) Are you done? Yes, sir. Kelly would like you to answer a question. Mm -hmm. Love the Joe Exotic episode. I would like to know how this was arranged and who is next. Well, Kelly, I I thought we explained this. This was all Dale. I don't know how he got it done. He still hasn't told me. Be real honest, I'm not asking many questions. Both Clifton and I were very skeptical that this was actually going to happen. I think Dale was too, to some extent, but he had more faith than the rest of us. And uh, But it it was a fun episode. Again, everybody's like, oh, y'all should have him on again. I I don't think that I can, personally. I'm just going to be real. I mean, like, I'm good. That is as much dealing with Joe Exotic as I need, at least for a while. But I it was very popular, and I had many people reach out to me and say, y'all should do more episodes like this. Well, that's fine and dandy and wonderful, and if y'all all have access to 900 celebrities, then send your cards and letters, and we'll get right on trying to scheduling some. It's not that we... Would not like to want to do one of these every once in a while. It was a bonus episode. It wasn't, you know, the weekly episode. And it, they, it was fun and all this other stuff. But finding celebrities that just want to come on a livestock podcast, probably not going to be the easiest thing to do, but we will try. Absolutely, Kelly. We, we will do our best. And I, I'm I'm very hesitant to even mention any of them that, that I have reached out to. Because uh, we, we have no confirmations at all. Don't. And even once I get a confirmation like Joe, Clifton did, wasn't even recording it when he called. Is, is how I didn't even had. tell Callie this was happening. That's how little <laughs> belief I had in the thing. Okay. Oh, my. Yes, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. So we're going to leave that alone. If we can have another bonus episode, Kelly, we certainly will. I'm glad 
those of you that that reached out and enjoyed it, great. Um, we'll, we'll do what we can to, to have some more of those. I I enjoy those. They're just they're just fun. You just do it. There's no real purpose outside of entertainment. Jennifer, love the podcast and learn so much each week. Thank you very much. My question is: My kids have been showing goats for four years. And we battle every year to get leg hair on the goats. We rinse at least every other day, but nothing seems to change. Kind of fits the topic, doesn't it? What? I, I'm sorry. I, my thing cut out. Can you repeat it again? I, I didn't hear anything other than fits the topic. My, my kids have been showing goats for four years, and we battle every year to get leg hair on the goats. We rinse at least every other day, but nothing seems to help. All right. Again, this is a problem for lots of people and Dale just addressed this a little bit that they don't have that problem in their goats. So my suggestion would be buy a goat from Dale. No, other I, than I, that, all, I am all in on that one. I mean, <laughs> other than that, our corporate sponsor show coat, everyone that I have ever that I know and trust that have used that problem has said that it, it has helped the hair quality on their animals. Uh, lots of them say that it helps hair growth, all that. So again, I haven't used it personally, but I, Dale has and other people that I trust implicitly have. And so that is something I also know that I have used melatonin hair pills and stuff like that. Those work in cattle. I know people that use them in goats. It works there. So like everything else, I think it's kind of a trial and error type thing. Uh, again, th- there are lots of different recipes, potions, lotions, creams, whatever, remedies, uh, things that you can do. Th- those are the two that I know that have worked for people that I trust or have worked for me. So I will go out there with those two. Dale could probably give you a little more in depth on what they do for hair growth in terms of daily care. This is going to sound terrible. Some of Again, our- go buy one from Dale because he's <laughs> going to say they do nothing. <laughs> Some of our best, our shaggiest goats ever are when we wean the goats, we bring them to the home farm, we put them in a pen with a dozen others, and we feed them two or three times a day and give them fresh water and keep their pen clean. We pull them out of there a couple weeks later. We wash them for the first time and we picture them. And they've got the most shag they've ever had. And we have done absolutely nothing. Now, with that said, um, I don't know that we can do a lot. to change. That is not the protocol you send out to people that buy your goats, sir. Just, no, I will give you the protocol. I'll, I'll, the recommendations that I make. We, I'm not saying I want, do that. I wouldn't do that because they need to buy <laughs> a goat. I would okay. give a couple of hints. I, Jesus. I want, I want the, the, the kids to work the hair because it's not just about growing hair or having shag, but let's make it manageable. Kind of like when Cade and Ryan were talking about, let's, let's, if we're going to fit the pigs, let's make that hair, work that hair and get it going the right direction. All those things, just like you would in cattle. So work that hair and it's going to look that much better when it comes time to pull that hair up and look very natural. And I'm in on this natural, the cast Ryan was talking about the plaster Paris cast that we put on some of these goats legs. Don't do that when you, when I'm sorting, just don't, it doesn't work. It's a bad idea with the care of, of the leg hair. I talked to Mr. Showcoat in the show in Alabama, uh, Ryan, our corporate sponsor. And I, I certainly would never want to offend him because I use that product. And I use that product because it is phenomenal for the conditioning of the skin and hair and training of the hair. I cannot confirm nor deny if it makes the hair grow more. Um, I, I really don't know. I think that's a hard one to quantify. Um, but phenomenal. It's going to look that much better by, by using that. So I strongly encourage that. So Jennifer, in, in, in the bottom line is, and, I, and whether you're talking goats, cattle, sheep with, with leg wool, or even pigs nowadays, I'm telling you, age is going to help the pigs out a little bit, but for the most part, it's going to be genetic. It, it just is. And you can do a lot of different things. We have a steer in the cooler as we speak, and that's going to help. But you really have to start with something if you expect it to be really good long term. Next comes Kip. I've heard you guys talk about supplements that claim to do it all, maybe not living up to their claims. I think we have mentioned that possibly, maybe. How do we know what is real and what is snake oil? This is all you. It's a very <laughs> sensitive topic. 
<laughs> not for me. But very sensitive for you. No, it's not sensitive for me at all. Uh, again, um, I have stated on here before that when we were, were the families that I helped, when I was feeding them, when Sean used very few supplements, and uh, I, I am perfectly fine saying that. The few that we did use, I, I have said, like Dale has said on here, I think normally the, I would say 99% of the time, the more direct that if it says it can do this specifically, probably a higher impact that it can, because I don't know if there is one that does everything. I, I, I have yet to find that product and uh, or find that supplement or whatever. And if and just being completely honest, if there was one out there that did everything, then that one would be the only one that anybody bought and everybody else be out of business. And so uh, that's into it. Uh, I, I do think depending on the animals you're feeding, where you are in terms of your location, the climate, all those other things, I do think that different supplements can help you in different ways. But just like I said on this last question about hair growth, unfortunately, a lot of it is trial and error. Seems very simple, doesn't it? I, I didn't think that was a problem. No, very good. Well, guys, this was a longer episode than I anticipated, and it is sale day for me today so I've, I've got a lot of text Ryan if, I'm going to shoot some your way if you'd like to answer some sure I'll be glad to <laughs> um, but thank you for joining us this week until next week be safe y'all come back now you hear <laughs>